Douglas County Sheriff says knowing what he knows now, he still would not have sent in a tactical team to get the heavily armed, mentally ill man who had ranted against police. The man who then shot five officers, killing Deputy Zachary Parrish. The sheriff's office provided the unedited body camera video that re we requested. It shows the officers regrouping after talking to the eventual shooter and deciding that they want to take him in on a mental health hold. We can't hear what they're discussing, whether they consider asking for a SWAT team. We are not going to be showing the violence after they re-enter the apartment. But within a minute, they are at the shooter's bedroom door. Deputy Parrish kicks it, and the killer starts shooting. We were provided this video after Nine Wants Snow's Kevin Vaughn was allowed a few minutes to talk with Sheriff Spurlock. And what you know now, would, would you back off and call in the SWAT team or handle this some other way other than going into the apartment after him? Uh, knowing what I know now, I'm guessing that my officers are going to do the exact same thing. It's just not, one, appropriate and not um, feasible to call a SWAT team on every mental health call. Not every mental health call. We had over 500 of them since we started the CRT response. This is the first one that's gone this violent. And the presence of weapons doesn't change that equation in your mind? Well, I said it before, and I had tend to get myself in a little bit of trouble for it. Um, there, there's, there's weapons on every call because we're responding to them. So I don't know that's in, what's in your house and what's not, and we assess everything based upon it. And I think in this case it was evident. You know, those officers went in there um, knowing that there was weapons. Um, but we still address people all the time uh, with weapons. We deal with them in cars with weapons. Uh, we go to all kinds of calls all the time. And, you know, that's, it, it doesn't change the way that we police here in Douglas County um, because there's just a large presence of weapons. Kevin Vaughn joins us now. So let's talk about why we in the media ask to see these videos, why we share them with independent law enforcement experts after an incident like this. Well, first of all, it's to understand exactly what happened in a tragic situation like this. And then second of all, it's to look at things like training, tactics, policies, and maybe things that might be done different in the future to try to prevent something like this from happening again. Despite some pretty early rosy pronouncements after Columbine and the Aurora shooting, major changes came about after reviews. That's right. Columbine changed the way police officers deal with active shooters. All the training is different now. They confront them right away. There's no more setting up a perimeter and waiting for the SWAT team. And out of the Aurora theater shooting, think about police officers now. It's pretty routine that they put wounded people in their cars and take them to hospitals. They don't wait for ambulances anymore. An even more recent example that's here and that's local, you have the death of Park County Sheriff's Corporal Nate Kerrigan last year. Similar situation that you were going in in a high-risk situation against somebody that they knew was armed and antagonistic toward police. That situation has now resulted in what? Litigation? Under sheriff's gone, sheriff is about to leave office, but centers around decision making. Right. In that case, what we do know, though, is that that was a planned uh, entry to that house drawn up by supervisors in a meeting with the officers. There's still a lot we don't know about the decision making process here when they decided to go into that apartment and confront the gunman in this case. Yeah, and the hope is best practices save lives. Kevin, thank you. Democratic State Representative Steve Lebsock is burning down the house, defending himself from sexual misconduct allegations by hand delivering a 28 page manifesto to colleagues as he tries to fend off his removal from office. In this manifesto, Lebsock graphically details the sex life of one accuser. He outs her for having an extramarital affair and adds that she did not report a sexual assault by another person at the Capitol. But wait, there's more. Lebsock says in the case of another of his accusers, he couldn't have been unbuttoning her blouse at a bar because he was playing Ms. Pac-Man at the time and got a really high score. A fellow Democrat may introduce a measure to kick Lebsock out of the House as soon as tomorrow when the state legislative session begins. And there is another enormous dumpster fire in town. This one is visible from the metro area. It's the recycling plant fire up north. It's a video from earlier today when things were really cranking along. Ivy Street is closed in the area east of I-70 and Colorado Boulevard. The Denver Fire Department has had its monitors out there to check on the air quality. They say they have not detected anything toxic burning. You would be amazed how much in politics can come down to just one ticked off parent and one politician who is willing to listen. A fed up dad in North Denver is teamed up with a city councilwoman to fix a problem they see. They spoke with Jordan Chavez. Just spend a few minutes with a man everyone knows as Ray G, and you'll quickly learn his two daughters are his top priority. Now, baby, 
They depend on me, you know? While every parent has their worries, Ray is reminded of his biggest one every day. There's one. All these trucks are just coming through here and it's, it's dangerous, you know? You got kids out here. You got kids trying to play. And not only does he have two-year-old Ava, he has an eight-year-old who has to navigate her Globeville neighborhood streets every morning when she walks to school. They can kill, me, kill people, you know? Not only can they, they have. The executive director of the Grow House nonprofit in the Elyria Swansea neighborhood says one of their volunteers was killed by a semi two years ago when she was biking home. I've been talking with city council, uh, writing letters. Letters Councilwoman Deborah Ortega has been reading. Where people are just wanting to get off the highway that are not doing local deliveries, that's where the enforcement and the signage becomes really critical to protect these communities. She says the city needs to act now before construction to expand I-70 begins and the problem gets worse. Because you got a lot of kids that cross that street to get to school. Which is why Ray is hoping something will happen soon. Yeah, huh? Before he has two daughters walking to school. For next, I'm Jordan Chavez. Beyond safety, there's also the issue of pollution. Councilwoman Ortega says that neighborhood is one of the most polluted areas in Colorado, and she claims that 80% of that is traffic. I-70 obviously runs right through there as well. Republican Senator Cory Gardner has followed through on his threat. He put a blanket hold on Justice Department nominations over weed. Just yesterday, the White House sent four picks for assistant attorney general jobs and a nominee for a U.S. Marshal in Alabama. That might be close to home for Jeff Sessions, the attorney general who's from Alabama, the man who last week ended a federal policy giving states leeway if they legalize marijuana. Under the new policy, the feds have power to decide how tough to be on legal cannabis. Senator Gardner says the attorney general misled him on the issue during his confirmation process. They're going to meet tomorrow privately. Also, four of Colorado's representatives in the House sent a letter to Attorney General Sessions asking him to reverse course on this. It is bipartisan only because of Congressman Mike Kaufman, the only Republican to sign. Republican Congressman Scott Tipton, Ken Buck, and Doug Lamborn did not. Those Girl Scouts in Aurora continue to make those cookie stereotypes crumble. They were at the Aurora City Council study session last night when their proposed law, their proposed law, moved a bit closer to reality. They're trying to earn their Girl Scout Silver Award in the process by passing this piece of legislation. They want to make it illegal in Aurora to smoke in a car with a child inside. This is now going to get a full hearing from City Council in two weeks. The 420 party isn't for another three months. So uh, who is token up in Denver yesterday for it to look like this? Kind of had a 1980s brown cloud feel. Bad enough that we saw Brad Dempsey tweeted a screenshot of his air quality app. Denver's air was what you might expect in Beijing, China. But is this really accurate? Well, take a deep breath as our Marshall Zellinger verifies. When we say it's going to be cloudy in Denver, we don't really mean brown cloudy anymore, maybe 20 or 30 years ago. But yesterday's inversion brought back our old frenemy. Anytime you have a layer of warm air that gets stuck on top of uh, that layer of cold air beneath, it condenses that layer of pollution and you see a little bit more. So much so that Brad Dempsey tweeted this comparison from his air quality index app, showing Denver at an unhealthy 174, while Beijing, China was a good 29. So to verify, we checked with the people who monitor Colorado's air quality. The Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment has more than two dozen monitoring stations around the Denver metro area, including the camp location on Broadway, just like Brad's tweet. But the state's highest recording there yesterday was 106, which is orange, unhealthy for sensitive groups. At a different station, Denver's highest level was 118, still not 174. Either way, the higher the number, the more stuff you shouldn't be breathing in. A website that monitors worldwide air quality had Beijing peak at 68 yesterday. So yes, it's true, Beijing's air quality was better than Denver yesterday. Though state regulators tell us Denver averages an air quality index between 20 and 40, while Beijing is often 160 to 170. For next, I'm Marshall Zellinger. Grab a beer during the break. Get your credit card while you're at it. Few of your dollars can help a few of Colorado's veterans go to Washington to visit memorials they would otherwise never see. And the artists who made parts of Denver cool can't live there anymore, so they're fighting back with art. Next.
This is the most wonderful experience for me. It brings back an awful lot of memories. All the guys in heaven right now are looking down and, and waving and saying hello, and everything is beautiful. I'm just thinking how fortunate I am to be here. See all of this, you know, after so many years. Yeah. After 90, 94 years, still around. Don't know for how many more, but uh, enjoy it while I can. You bet. You have met the veterans here on Next. You've heard them express their gratitude for your generous help in getting them to Washington to see the memorials dedicated to their service. Tonight, these kind folks are taking your phone calls as we help Rocky Mountain Honor Flight fill more plane loads out of Denver. They tell us it is $60,000 for one plane full of vets to go to Washington and back. Those vets are not charged a dime. So let's see what we can do today. You met Mac McCurry. Remember him? We met uh, Mac and Betty over the summer. Mac had to leave Betty when he enlisted for World War II. They thought that their romance was over. It was not. They reconnected and got married within a week. You went along with us as we uh, met Betty and met Mac. She was back home in Wheat Ridge, and they talked about their times Hello. together before and after Hi. the war. Oh, I love her on the phone. Time? Then we showed you what Les Mendelssohn got to experience yeah. when he returned to DIA after a trip to Washington, D.C. with the Honor Flight. His was the 360-degree story that you saw, where you witnessed everything that the crowd saw and everything that Mac saw all at once. That was a special experience. So we encourage you to join us in helping more veterans from our community make that flight of a lifetime. Our Honor Flight Telethon continues until 7 o'clock. You can also don donate online as well, 9news.com or the 9 News app. I understand that you have already ge generously donated $83,000 today. That is one plane full and a good way through the next. So let's see if we can do it. 9news.com is the easiest place to donate. Out here in Denver didn't make for the prettiest of views, and we may still see some haze in the city come tomorrow morning at the very least. We are looking at moderate air quality and moderate visibility in Denver through tomorrow and then. Pretty big storm system will be moving into the state, brings in much needed mountain snow that will really pick up and become very heavy by 1 o'clock Wednesday afternoon. But for Denver, we are just too warm. This is mostly rain for us. We may see that transition over to snow just in time for tomorrow evening's drive. And then it's done with moving out by tomorrow night. So since we see mostly rain, we don't get accumulation here in Denver. Best chance for it will be in parts of Elbert County who could get up to half an inch of snow. And then from our foothills out to the west along the Continental Divide, two to six inches of snow will be possible. West of Vail Pass, we're looking at eight to 16 inches of snow for most locations, 10 to 20 inches down in those southwest San Juans. Again, there you see along the Continental Divide, two to six inches of snow possible. Eastern Plains getting one to three inches of that snow before it moves out by early Thursday. We saw today is just some casual swimming in the waters of Clear Creek. Gage Pallone and John Paul Luke go to Colorado School of Mines. They're done with their classes for the day, so they figured, why not? This will be relaxing, right? This is a thing that they do. They try to get into the water once a month, no matter what the weather. That's pretty wild. I'm sorry, today was warm, but I see the ice, you see the ice. Hey, you know our Noel Brennan here on Next who's brought us so many great stories? His dad, Terry, knows a good story when he sees one. This is Terry Brennan sharing the most Colorado thing he saw today. Artists pushed out of their neighborhoods with Denver's changes find a place for their art. And did you know DIA is not actually an airport? Have we been calling it the wrong thing all along? This is very embarrassing. Next. Denver's gentrification means less affordable housing and less space for the artists who turn less than desirable neighborhoods into the next big thing. A group of displaced artists is banding together and we see their story through the lens of our photojournalist Corky Scholl. We're at Spark Gallery. That's pretty good. There you go. We have opened a show called The New Underground. We're featuring artists who have been under pressure and displaced through gentrification of art districts in Denver. We wanted to do a show 
about the galleries that have had to move. We'd like to shine a light on these galleries. Well, what's happening in Denver is that developers have looked to the art districts in Denver. In essence, they have become so popular, people are looking to make profit on these. Denver loves being this kind of hot city and having a lot of fun and really um, promoting the arts. Many galleries are getting their rents doubled, so they're moving out to cheaper spaces. And people like to tap into that coolness. And unfortunately, sometimes cool people don't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So it's like, let's get rid of the cool people and move in where they are, and then we'll be cool. Mm -hmm. But you can't be cool without us. <laughs> it's happened that way forever. Artists develop areas and then get uh, booted out of them. That's why we named the show The New Underground, because the, the artists are moving. And where artists are, that's where the art district is. It's not where a planning group says, let's call it an art district. Hey, Denver, look what's happening to your art scene. It's moving. That art show opens to the public Thursday, runs through February 4th. It's at Spark Gallery, Ninth and Santa Fe. Artists from five displaced galleries will have their work on display. Our next question comes from Anthony J. Clark on Twitter. Kyle, I know it isn't easy to drop DIA when reporting, but do you think you'll fully refer to Denver Airport as DEN? DEN rules, Park 20 Airport Security Rules and Regulations, 20.00 Key Definitions and Acronyms. You seem like a stickler for detail, Anthony. I'm more of a you know, conversational go-with-the-flow type of guy. Not much for the corporate naming rights that always change or the fancy rebranding campaigns. I kind of prefer to just use the common language that most people do, with an occasional twist. So the Broncos Stadium is just mile high. Their training facility, it's still Dove Valley. And Dick's Sporting Goods Park is a lot easier to say if you call it the Richard. So yes, the airport has some shiny new commercials that call itself by its official call sign, DEN. But they're totally not heavy-handed about what the rest of us call it. Heath Montgomery, spokesman for DIA. Thank you. Or Den. Heath is kind of a BFD at DIA, and even he doesn't give a Damascus International if you don't use the official airport designation, Den. DIA has really been a part of our brand identity for a long time, so we certainly don't have a problem with people using that name interchangeably with DEN or DEN or Denver's Airport or Denver International. It, it really doesn't matter to us. Thanks for being cool, airport spokesman. That's why you're next BFF. When it comes to official airport codes, there's a ton. Yet no DIA. We are DEN, no matter what some Sarma Lake International Airport calls it on TV. But the nice folks at the airport aren't mad as Helsinki Airport if we use the old phrase. They're more likely to laugh than get hot about it. I, I think it's all interchangeable. Thanks for being chill, DIA. Almost makes me want to call you Den. Appreciate all of you who have generously donated to the Rocky Mountain Honor Flight Telethon. Just got an updated number. I think you guys kicked in about another $7,000 while we were talking here. We're now up to $90,800. To clarify what Karen asked about, when I said each plane load of veterans leaving Colorado cost $60,000, that's for the full plane, all of the vets on there. We're halfway to a second plane full of vets going to D.C. to see the memorials. And an apology to Ryan Pippett, who says that my line about a dumpster fire made him choke on his dinner. We are not liable for such incidents here. See you next time.